see we it's, it's five it's five past nine so um it's a good option to make a start um this i still see this there are people joining um yeah, it's likely to tap them over the next couple of minutes uh, but i think we can we can start um yeah getting getting cracking with um yeah with with, with the session so yeah um very yeah, excited for the session and um, obviously the title is Introduction to Camera Track Monitoring um, Biodiversity in Etiquini and we've got a number of, of interesting presentations um, from colleagues from UKZ and UKZ and Wildlife. Um, I'm very fortunate and grateful to them for giving up their time to, um, yeah, to, to share with us their, their um, expertise in, in, the, in, this, in this specific field. Um, yeah, I see that uh, Preshni has you know, asked everyone to introduce themselves on the chat. I think that's probably a far better, um, far better option. Um, Preshni, if you wouldn't mind just going to that um, the first slide, please, if possible. Thank you. So, yeah, um, just by kind of way of, way of introduction, and firstly, maybe to introduce myself, I'm uh, Cameron McLean. I'm a senior ecologist from um, municipalities. Biodiversity Management Department. So I sit in the biodiversity planning branch of that of that department. Um, yeah. So the intention of this um, of this this workshop is obviously to kind of many, not many people I'd imagine on this call have had been introduced to camera trapping the the uses of it um, in terms of biodiversity monitoring, um, and it's just to yeah obviously introduce. Um, introduce the field to everyone through some some practical examples, um, you know, vets and, and and others will go into a bit more detail. Up these types of um, types of projects. Um, can I just confirm that everyone can hear me? I see my internet connection is saying it's unstable. Yes, we can. Okay. If um if I do if it if it is if it, if it does continue with it like that, um then just yeah just maybe just drop me a message. Uh, I see Russell saying he's lost me. Uh, Prishvi, can you confirm? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, I think it's something on, on, on Russell's side because uh, I can hear you. Hi uh, guys, please just sorry about this. Just give me two seconds while I just try to switch over to different internet source. Hi guys, sorry about that. Um, just confirming, Krishni, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Anyone else? Any, can you hear me? Good morning, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, okay. No, that's that, that's good. Thanks, guys. And sorry about that. Yeah, we've got intermittent um, network here at the, at the office. I've gone on to, um, I've gone on to, on to hotspots. So hopefully that that will solve that issue. Um, 
yeah, so like I said, I'm not going to take much time because of this, of this connectivity issue, but um, yeah, it's an intention of, of today is just to introduce um, camera, camera trapping as a tool to assist municipal officials in, in monitoring biodiversity in green space in Antiquini. Um, and yeah, as you can see, the aim is to, um, to cover aspects related to camera trap's use, um, data created, how to set up usable data collection and suggestions for analysis. And then some discussions on best practice about how to implement this tool, not only for local use, but to fit into the bigger research aims across KZN. Um, I'm going to share quickly um, my screen, if that's okay. Um, Press me. Um, just see. Just confirm if you can see that. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, All right, so um, just kind of by way of introduction, just to kind of um, bring everyone into the kind of same space, because I, no I noticed that there's, there's people from different organizations, but also to um, kind of get some of my colleagues in our department thinking about some of, of, um, of where this might fit into their work. Um, so just by way of introduction, just very briefly, we know that um, obviously Durban is situated within one of the global biodiversity hotspots in Switzerland, Poland, or the new region. So area, the broader area and in Durban itself is characterized by, by high levels of endemism. Um, so it means you know, a number of species that only occur within the that, that um, broader biodiversity hotspot area. Um, and also these areas are characterized by being under significant threats. And the kind of clearest example that you can see is if you look at the vegetation types that, that we have within, within Durban, um, just the the transformation that has occurred over the years, you can see only about around a third of that of the original, original habitat types um, within, within the Etiquini area. And those are by no means in, in, in pristine condition, we know that they range of condition you know, across, across the landscape. Um, in addition, only 3% of, of Durban's area enjoys some form of legal protection. So, you know, proclaimed nature reserves, um, conservation zones, those type of, those type of uh, interventions. And all this, what this means is that we situate situated in a low choice planning environment. So the ability to meet conservation targets, the uh, minimum area required in order to maintain uh, species richness in certain areas is incredibly limited. Um, and obviously being situated in an urban context, significant pressures for, for land transformation. Um, we need to look at new and innovative ways of, of motivating for biodiversity. So um, obviously, in our workflows, we've um, particularly when I'm thinking about like, the development assessment space um, we've, and even the management context, um, we've placed a, a major reliance on vegetation types as proxies for biodiversity. And that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of best practice um, in terms of conservation planning, um, but is limited in terms of um, you know, making making a broader, broader case for, for biodiversity protection. Um, camera trapping to date is um, in terms of how it's been used is, um, is, is particularly limited. Um, it's mainly been um, to generate kind of gone public interest around, around certain sites. Um, and this is why we're wanting to um, have this workshop to introduce where we can possibly um, apply it across different, in different contexts within, um, within the municipality and influence different workflows, um, particularly within our biodiversity management departments. Um, so you'll see in terms of some of the workflows of our, of our departments, um, it's kind of built around our systematic conservation assessment. Um, and that, that forms a natural home for where formal data could sit and influence a lot of, a lot of our different uh, areas. We've obviously got the, the bottom left our Durban Metropolitan Open Space System. So that's the, the kind of primary output from our systematic conservation assessment. But there are a number of other workflows where I'd like colleagues to think about um, how formal data and uh, basing it to your, your work areas, how you can see value in, in informing the different places. Here I'm looking at things like our, our biodiversity impact assessment team, um, you know, whether additional formal data to supplement some of the the vegetation data that we're constantly using um, could benefit in, in those processes and more broadly within informing some of our management activities uh, along uh, our conservation areas some of the nature reserves that we do manage um, yeah so there's a whole there's a whole range of, um, of ways that the cats uh, this is just a breakdown of, of the different workflows that the systematic conservation assessment 
forms. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like colleagues just to keep this in the back of their mind. And, and when it comes to the discussion a little bit later, um, to, to ask some questions and, and interrogate where this, where this information could be useful. Great. Um, I'll stop sharing if that's okay. Um, I don't actually know how to do that, Krishni. Um, so you might have to. <laughs> might have to do it for me. Um, and we'll um, move swiftly along um, onto our first presentation. Krishni, I yeah. Um, yeah, thanks very much. So, uh, the first presentation is recorded Jared, um, yeah, maybe we'll push through any questions after Bali's presentation, but we'll certainly. Hello, everyone. My name is Mbalenta Sosibo, and I'll be presenting on the multi-species occupancy modeling of mammals in the southern Misbel forests of Eastern Cape and Wazulu Natal in South Africa. Anthropogenic activities have resulted in habitat loss and fragmentation across different landscapes, resulting in habitat loss, fragmentation, and the decrease in species biodiversity. South African forests have also been subjected to damaging anthropogenic activities, such as heavy logging and unmonitored burning, as well as intense hunting for bushmeat and sports. Clearing of these forests for agriculture and plantations is also considered a major threat to forests and the fauna that inhabit them. To protect and manage the utilization of the forests, we need to monitor and research the response of species to their changing environment. So the aim of the study was to estimate site occupancy and detection probability of individual species across a mixed land use gradient within the inland southern Misbelt forests. The study was conducted in the southern Misbelt forests of Wazulu Natal and Eastern Cape, which are naturally located within the grassland biome. The tree species that dominate these forests are the yellowwood species, and that is why they are also known as yellowwood or Podocarpus forests. We selected three forest clusters, which are the Mtata area in Eastern Cape, and Crichton, which is in KwaZulu-Natal, and the Glengarry Reza area, which is also in KwaZulu-Natal, which will now be referred to as Ingeli. We used camera traps to monitor mammalian species presence and absence at set points, determined using a 400 meter by 400 meter systematic grid system in GIS. For occupancy, land use covariates were extracted from one kilometer buffers around each forest patch. Camera station distance from forest edge was measured for detection probability. And for the data analyses, we modeled multi-species occupancy. 14 species were identified for our study with 1,774 camera images of individual mammals. The extracted land use data showed that there was a high proportion of commercial plantation land use surrounding forest stations, and our multi-species model was a good fit for our data. Species detections varied across forest clusters with the bush buck having the most detections and the vervet monkey, which had the lowest. Overall, the large spotted genet had the highest mean occupancy and the bush buck having the highest detection probability. Both of these species are commonly found in these forests. However, the vervet monkey had the overall lowest occupancy and detection across the sites. The three dominant land uses were commercial plantations, namely eucalyptus, pine, and black wattle. The other two land uses were grasslands and human settlements. Species occupancy and detection response varied in the forest surrounded by the different land uses. 
As a generalist species, the black backed jackal is able to exploit various environments, such as forest and woodland, savanna, and arid environments like the Namakaru and grassland. The surrounding plantations are typically at different ages of maturity with structural and compositional differences so that, can, that they can support certain mammalian species with varying habitat requirements and life history traits. Semango monkeys have been known to forage in adjacent black wattle plantations and mature exotic timber plantations. Although structurally homogeneous, they can facilitate the movement of these species within their canopies in comparison to on the ground in open areas. Site-specific occupancies for Samango monkey were higher in the Mtata area as well as the Ngeli area, which are dominated by mature pine plantations that have been considered arboreal corridors. These may have contributed to the higher occupancy rates at these sites. Bushbuck had the second highest occupancy in the Ngeli sampling area. Other studies found high densities of bushbuck here and in surrounding exotic timber plantations. Bushbuck were more likely to use areas where there were exotic timber plantations, and these plantations may act as a buffer zone that may provide resources in different seasons. Land use directly surrounding forest patches played a role in the occupancy of forest mammals and how they used and distributed themselves within the forest patches. Our results highlighted how the bordering land use of human settlements, grassland and pine plantations play an integral role in the mammalian occupancy. Exotic timber plantations adjacent to these forests have notably been documented as a type of habitat conversion that negatively affects mammalian forest communities. However, they are frequently considered forests in land use assessments and can provide corridors between forest patches of conservation value. The core type of habitat had more detections, making it important for conservation purposes. By identifying and conserving these habitats within a landscape, we increase the chances of species populations success over time. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Prashni, and thanks, Mbali, in your absence. Um, can everyone hear me? Is that a bit better? I know um, I was struggling earlier. Is that yeah, loud better? and clear? Okay, great. That's great. Um, yeah, so I think that was a particularly useful presentation. Nice to um, yeah, obviously the key messages being around kind of large, well connected um, habitats <coughs> and conservation areas, but but also linked to that the potential portion of the uh, importance of some of our transitional habitats. You think about Durban, you know, there's, there's large areas of um, you know, invasive woodlands um, and kind of you know, regenerating forests and, and not necessarily discount them straight away um, if they are located immediately adjacent to conservation areas. Um, yeah, so I think the next presentation um, will be Jared, Jared Strucker. Um, yeah, Jared, can I hand over to you? Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just seeing where I can share my screen. Uh, Preshni, have you managed to arrange that I can share my screen? Yes, so uh, there's open sharing. Okay, okay, there we go. Um, on. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jazz Stryker. Um, I'm at the University of Kazuna Tsal, and uh, today I'll just be giving a presentation not on camera traps. Unfortunately, this is, but we did use camera traps in, in the project, but looking at sort of the behavioral plasticity of uh, two Mongo species in different transformed landscapes. And it's not changing slide. There we go. So approximately 22% of all mammal species are threatened globally. Uh, anthropogenic land use change is one of the greatest threats to terrestrial mammals. And there, and there appears to be a threat 
uh, differs across different body size. Um, it's been noted that generalist and small to medium sized uh, mammals uh, are increasing in landscape uh, and be, as landscapes become increasingly homogenized, the, the presence becomes more prevalent, uh, particularly in the absence of apex predators. Uh, and so a theory of mesoev carnival release or mesoev predator release. Uh, as an important as scientists, researchers and conservationists alike that we understand the drivers of these changes and the impacts of the environment and how we can better understand these drivers to, so we yeah so we have a better understanding of these drivers in the future for better conservation so the impacts of anthropogenic land use modification human persecution and habitat destruction have generally precluded uh, large carnivores uh, within general green areas and conservation areas and the only sort of limited to protected reserves. Um, the absence of larger predators uh, increases habitat availabilities and resources to uh, smaller mesocarnivores, and it allows them to thrive in these vacant niches. So small carnivores in general are of special concern because they're generally overlooked compared to the larger carnivore counterparts. And so they've generally been not as studied in, in a large, to a larger extent. Um, although they show quite a lot of behavioral plasticity uh, in their diets, their activity, and how they interact with one another, and they're able to exploit various anthropogenic resources and increase their population sizes and densities. But they, are, they do prove quite difficult to study. So the ecology of small to medium sized carnivores is of importance and how we can model these um, can be important to conserving landscapes in the future, particularly urbanized areas. Um, if you look at the Hepestidae family, which is what this uh, presentation will be mainly about, uh, they've been largely understudied in KZN in Southern Africa. And baseline information was only generated on their movements sort of in the 1980s and very little since uh, our study. So minimal work in Africa and not much understanding of human wildlife conflicts. So the aim of our study was to investigate the ecology of two mongoose species in Kuzi Natal and how the home range and habitat use differs across different land use gradients and what degree they're persisting or thriving uh, with different impacts of anthropogenic influences. Uh, we also have looked at interactions of um, or aspects of, of the diet, the activity, human perspectives, uh, which we ran across these landscapes, these, these different landscapes. And um, ultimately we don't have enough time for that presentation. Um, so just a bit of bit of info. So here's the previous literature showing the home range of two mongoose species, water and large grain, and the previous literature for uh, a very simple home range estimate. Uh, and we can see uh, the overall ranges of how, what they expected the, the home ranges to be. So our first individual is a water mongoose. It has a wide distribution throughout uh, Africa stretching from Southern Africa up into Central Africa. Um, the activity is mainly nocturnal and once again, quite a generalist uh, diet uh, with aquatic aspects, uh, with being medium sized and um, habitat is mainly dominant by riparian environments. So they're excluded from deserts and dryland areas. Our next species was a large gray mongoose, or otherwise known as Egyptian mongoose also have a fairly wide distribution, uh, stretching all the way from Southern Africa up uh, into Northern Africa and even into the Iberian Peninsula. So large gray generally have a diurnal activity, a generous terrestrial diet, uh, slightly smaller than a water mongoose and habitats of preference are sort of grassland and dense bush uh, where they can feed on different rodents and reptiles and then discourage into the bush uh, to hide away from predators. So our trapping sites were three sites within the KZN Midlands. So that's 
uh, the farmland mosaic, and then the different sites within Kloof to Kreni and the different matrices of landscape there. Uh, generally, the traps we covered with uh, vegetation to improve uh, camera or trapping success. We baited with chicken hearts and chicken intestines. And where the camera trap aspect comes in is we monitored those traps with uh, camera traps set up so that we could see what sort of activity we're getting from other uh, music carnivals in the area and other sort of raptors as well as other interesting uh, animals. Um, once the animal is trapped, we had a vet on standby. We shifted the animal to a containment trap. We sedated it uh, with some anakids and domitol. So here's a few pictures of uh, various other species investigating the, the trapping area where we had bait. So the top left corner is a large gray. Um, and just below it is a slender mongoose. We have some genets in the top right and then uh, feral cats, um, goshawks, and porcupines. We also had a few uh, caracons encounters. Unfortunately, we never managed to catch any caracals. That was a little side project, uh, but the, yeah, they're definitely pre prevalent within that Kranz Kloof Reserve and the surrounding green matrices around the area. So here we just have a, a caracal walking past one of my traps and not showing the slightest of interest towards it. We also got a few interactions of legs of interested uh, parties that came to see the traps. There was also a number of people that helped me within the clock, the Grants Club Conservancy, helping monitoring the traps and making sure that uh, the animal doesn't spend too much time in that area. So moving on to the trapped individual, we collected various morphometric measurements. We did blood uh, and anal swabs, and we fitted each uh, individual with a GPS UHF uh, collar if they met the strict weight requirements of less than, of the collar weighing less than 2% of the body weight. Uh, the collars were set to collect activity every hour, ambient temperature, uh, four GPS points per day during their times of activity. So nocturnal uh, GPSs for the water mongoose and diurnal GPS time frame for the large gray. And we set up base stations throughout the uh, the cliff area. So the analysis, I won't bore you guys with that, but just we ran various analyses in different programs to work out home ranges and core area use, as well as habitat analysis to see what habitats were driving, uh, were preferred by the individuals and which habitats were um, avoided by the different individuals. So in total over the project, uh, we call it 25 mongooses. Um, 19 were water mongoose and, and six were large gray with these with the different splits on the farmlands and the urban environments. Um, in total, we generally averaged about 270 GPS fixes and we had collected on, uh, uh, about 6,200 GPS fixes in total, so which makes it the largest data set on mongooses that have been collected. So here's quickly the the farmland environment, just all the pins of the same color, one individual, just showing the, the different movement patterns. Generally, yeah. And then an area which is an Etiquini, so we have here the Kloof area, here's all the, mostly the urban uh, roaming water mongoose. And then in the sort of bottom right corner, we have um, in purple, the only large gray we collected, and we can see that map, uh, big movement. Okay, shifting into the Nkonka Valley, just once again, just looking at the spatial movements of uh, water mongooses. Um, the green and the yellow pins are two male uh, water mongooses. Uh, they never ever crossed over the boundary lines, which shows some sort of uh, territoriality. But what you can see interesting from the pins is how they are completely within the green zones, the, the DMOS areas and really uh, venture out of those areas. So showing once again, the importance of those green open space systems. The same when we look at Everton area, we once again, these water mongoose were confined to these green zones. And then lastly, uh, in Sinzi area, um, although a lot more urbanized, uh, 
the green spaces allowed them to move around. And interestingly, the once again, the large gray, which was dependent on the grassland, had to move out of the area. If you can see the expansion uh, up to the top of the screen, uh, because they burnt that, that um, Sinzi grassland. So that individual was able to adapt and move off and find a new area to live in for a bit and then return to the area we caught it in. So just looking at the home range differences, uh, we can see quite a stark difference between the water mongoose caught in farmlands and urban areas, um, with urban, urban dwelling mongooses having a much smaller home range size for both the different uh, home range estimates that we used, uh, which is yeah, a very stark difference. And if we look at just a picture difference, you can see the the overall mean differences, and that gives quite a large contrast how confined the, the urban dwelling water mongoose home ranges were compared to farmlands. To some cases, about it's about six six times smaller in urban areas. Um, and then for large grey mongoose, we can see once again the trend is repeated, although we only caught one individual in the urban environment, uh, but we expected also that individuals' home range to be smaller than the farmland uh, dwelling large gray mongooses. And yeah, so just the, the, the confinement of the urban environment. So from previous literature, we can see that um, we have much larger home ranges within farmland environments uh, than what was previously expressed. And quite small areas within urban environments Although the large gray home range was larger than previously indicated in literature in the urban environment, which is great to see. So it just shows the importance of sort of GPS telemetry for this work. Just moving quickly to the habitat types, I just want to point out uh, the importance of water for water mongooses and as well as uh, forest and bushland areas. And for both water and large gray mongoose, the general avoidance of built up areas. So the, the strict importance of those green open space areas to allow these animals to, to thrive in quite a, a developed area. So significant natural habitat loss um, and the process of anthropogenic land use change of natural areas have led to habitat loss for both mongoose species, particularly within the urban, to, urban environment. Um, our study emphasizes how both the mongooses, the large grey and the water mongoose, have adapted under different pressures to persist when less preferred habitats are abundant. Uh, the natural farmland mosaic provided a optimal habitat type that allowed the two species to freely range and display their, their different home range sizes. Individuals can persist in the Durban Upper Highway area uh, this sort of semi-urban habitat, um, you can see the individuals reduce their home range sizes, uh, utilizing the different natural habitat spaces that were available to them. Um, however, water mongooses were mainly restricted to these fragments and rarely uh, ventured out into a residential urban mosaic. Um, as pointed out from the habitat analysis, they generally avoided built up areas. Uh, showing a sort of inflexibility towards humans' disturbances. And during our study, we came across a lot of human-wildlife interactions, um, namely where um, mongooses were hit by cars, as well as um, negative interactions with pets, where mongooses generally came off second best. So is there any idea of music carnival release? Um, well, the Large spots of gemmets seem to be doing well. The density of water mongoose seems to be uh, doing all right, but it requires further studies into seeing how these species are persisting uh, in these anthropogenically built up areas. Although they had the high density, the fragmented habitats um, gen can limit this. So it would be interesting to continue doing follow up studies to see how their populations are of maintaining or developing in these environments. And also to look at the species interactions between other mesocarnivores, uh, such as caracal in the area, as well as uh, between the different, the two mongoose species, as well as white-tailed mongooses and uh, large spots of chanids. Thank you very much for uh, 
your patience and attending the presentation. Um, I'd just like to thank the following entities for their help and allowing the project to be to go through smoothly. And if you have any questions, please send them on the chat. Thank you. Bye. Jared, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, it's not Greg. It's Cameron. I'm, I've jumped onto onto Greg's uh, computer because yeah, mine, mine just wasn't working. Um, Jared, thank you very much for that. That was that was incredibly interesting and and really relevant to a lot of the work that we're doing and planning on doing in that area. Um, yeah, open up for questions. I have a couple, but um, yeah, maybe just open the floor if there are any um, any questions um, that others have for um, for Jared. Don't all jump at once. We lost two. Okay, so um, Jared, maybe my my couple of questions is um, so we we're we're quite interested in getting um, some public private partnerships going for that in Conca Valley that you had up there, and also around around Everton um, and the Everton Conservancy. Um, I noticed that a couple of the um, the green spaces that that were there didn't necessarily have any records. I'm assuming that's from um, being cut off by fencing um, or something along those lines. Do you have any kind of insights or recommendations in terms of fencing, how they can be retrofitted, um, whether they can be um, to kind of adapt to um, yeah to kind of movement and things like that. I was going to just put up, share my screen again, just so we could actually have a look. Uh, but these animals are, are fairly adaptable, fairly flexible. So they, they can move through a bonox fence uh, quite easily. They're not hindered by that. Uh, through culverts as well, they can move. I mean, that um, that road that leads through the past the Kranzkloof uh, Reserve, a lot of animals use that, that culvert to go uh, to actually cross the road, they don't actually cross over the road. So, if you if you use Bonex fence, it should be uh, more than fine for the individuals. Um, unfortunately, with with the heavy vegetation, the the, the dense forest canopy, um, we didn't get a real clear picture of uh, the the spatial movements of uh, the mongooses, particularly in the Everton area, because there's quite a lot of canopy cover, and so you'll get a lot of missed GPS fixes in that area. Uh, but a bonnex fence should be, should be fairly fine for these animals to move through. Uh, there's enough space for them to, to get through. Great, yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has got, um, got any other, other questions. Um, uh, Greg's got a question. You want to ask it? Sorry. Where the music carnivores were actually sourced? Uh, Greg was asking where the music carnivores were sourced from. Yeah, so um, as in, uh, sorry, where they coming from to, to exist oh, in these green spaces. Before release, he's asking. Yeah. Sorry, before before release. No, the ones that are released. The ones that are released, he's asking. I think that's... Okay, well, we caught all of them in those uh, green spaces, but uh, meso carnivore release is just a, a theory that um, meso carnivores are, ex are expanding in their range uh, and their presence in the absence of apex predators. So it's it's a general theory that's that's going about. And there's a few studies overseas where they've where they've shown uh, different sort of medium-sized carnivores thriving in the, apex, in the absence of apex predators. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Was it more? Was an active release program. So. Okay, no, there's all sorts of thanks, thanks, Jan. Um, sure. Yeah, I, I think that's that's good. I don't see any other. I see Errol has a has a hand. Oh, Errol, Errol got his hand up. Yeah, go for it, Errol. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Just a quick question. Um, I, I assume a lot of these mongoose, uh, you know, not too long ago would have been seen as vermin and would have been actively shot out by farmers um, and you know, landowners who possibly are worried about them coming for chickens or, or other things. Um, do you know if that's still going on? Uh, and I suppose there's this dynamic of uh, increased development, um, destruction of habitat, but potentially, and I may be wrong, um, 
a decrease in hunting or sort of active trapping of, of the animals. Um, I don't know, have you got any comments on that, on, on how that's impacted populations? Thanks. Uh, thanks for the questions, Errol. Um, speaking to a number of the farmers and also with the, um, with the questionnaire you ran, um, farmers aren't actively going out to shoot uh, mongooses in particular. Uh, their main uh, mode of action for shooting is actually black-backed jackals. Uh, a lot of black-backed jackals are, get um, shot and controlled by farmers um, and not really mongoose per se. I think if they have a problematic mongoose uh, or Janet, they will try and sort out. There wasn't anything that came through the questionnaire that showed that they were uh, particularly targeting uh, mongooses. Um, it's just very interesting with the densities in the, in the farmland areas. Is for, uh, the, obviously, because it's more free ranging, the animals, the densities of the populations weren't um, as, as dense as within the urban areas. And also, I think natural diseases also control them a bit more in, um, in farmlands. So unfortunately, when I started my project, a lot of mongooses got, um, well, we, we had high densities of mongooses in the uh, Midlands area. And I think there was a rabies outbreak. So their populations got completely decimated, uh, although the server were out. And um, it took me eight months to catch my first mongoose uh, with a masters. So that was a, quite a stressful time. Um, yeah, and I don't, yeah, moving on to where they're targeted, I don't think they, they're particularly targeted. In the urban environments, they're facing more threats from uh, interactions with domestic pets, uh, as well as, um, yeah, and cars. They come off second best versus a car. Hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Cool, thanks, Errol. Thanks, thanks, Jared. Um, yeah, I think that's that's great. Are there any other, not any other hands? Um, yeah, we've got a break scheduled. Um, yeah, we're running slight a few minutes um, over time, but I think we we likely to end a lot a lot um, earlier than um, than twelve o'clock. Um, so maybe we can just break briefly and yeah, start again promptly at ten o'clock if everyone's comfortable with that. Thanks. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Um, so we could just jump straight into it if that's okay. Yvette, um, are you online and ready? Yes, I am, thank you. Oh, awesome, okay, cool. So yeah, we're very fortunate to have Yvette that is not to be able to present us. So um, Yvette, yeah, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I will um, just share my screen, I hope. Uh, share screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Yes, it's coming through. Oh, we've got you. Thank you. Um, and just thank you to Preshni for putting this together. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to speak to you all this morning. My name is Yvette Eller-Smith. I am an ecologist with Isenvelo Kazid and Wildlife and an honorary research fellow with um, the University of KwaZulu-Natal. So I'll be speaking about camera trapping and basically going over some uh, concepts around designing a camera survey um, and, you know, how you can apply the data, um, you know, in an effective manner if, you've, if you ensure that you've got a very well-designed survey regime. So the main goals um, of this presentation is to actually discuss the research question. So what is the aims and objectives of your camera trap survey? Um, looking at the application of camera traps in research, specifically looking at survey design, um, discussing some camera traps. So basically what makes the models or, you know, what, uh, taking into, consider, uh, con into consideration what your specific needs are, um, talking about uh, briefly about field setup for surveys, and then data collection. So when it comes to a camera trap survey, it's not just about 
the data, the photos or the, the images or the videos that the cameras collect, but also in terms of other metadata and information that actually makes that um, camera trap data valuable. Talk a little bit about data storage and then briefly touch on some analysis, giving some examples of what we did and the papers that we published using a single data set based on a standardized survey regime. So yeah, so the most important or the, the kind of fundamental underpinning of your uh, camera trap survey is your research question. What are the aims and objectives? What are you trying to achieve with your camera trap survey? So before you go into the field and before you deploy your um, camera traps, you need to think basically what are your research questions? What are the management objectives that you're trying to achieve? Um, and these questions or objectives will dictate um, the nature of your camera trap survey. Um, it will dictate the number of camera traps that are required, the length of the survey, placement of camera traps, and then also to consider is what type of analysis you're gonna undertake. Um, either whether it's specifically for a scientific publication, so whether you're working on a manuscript or if it's specifically for management reports. So, um, we always say to the students, it's incredibly important to consult the relevant literature surrounding your question or, uh, or objective. Um, think about the species uh, or a nearest equivalent thereof, the community, so the variety of different animals that you're um, aiming to um, study, look at the habitat that you're working in, and also the environmental conditions present within your study system. So the Indian Ocean coastal belt system is incredibly different compared to uh, the more kind of arid Karoo or, you know, those sorts of uh, very different habitat types. So once you've got your solid research question or your um, management objectives, then you can start putting together a framework um, and to, you know, in order to implement your camera trap survey. So types of research questions, is it a single species study? Are you focusing on um, one specific target species? So are you purely looking at presence or absence of that species within a specific habitat patch or within a, a reserve or some sort of management block? Are you trying to get an idea of population density? So your camera trap regime can give you like an idea of uh, relative abundance as well? Are you trying to look at specific behaviors within a specific area? So you can set up a camera trap um, on, a, on a nest or at a burrow to look at visitation rates. Um, you can also use camera traps to look at habitat preferences. So whether your specific species has a preference for wetlands over um, forest or, you know, whatever your, your target habitats are. So you can also look at a course measure of population status. So look at what fraction of a site or an area is being occupied by the species. So in terms of utilization, a broad scale um, camera trap survey can give you ideas of the distribution over a geographic range. Again, things like habitat re relationships, Long-term camera trap surveys can help you look at metapopulation dynamics. So you're looking at colonization and extinction of specific areas. And then over time, you can look at trends or the changes in a specific species occupancy over time. Um, also in terms of a community study, so you can either look at uh, an all-encompassing grassland or forest community, and with this, you can look at um, alpha and beta diversity or your functional groups, um, focusing on um, specific traits uh, that relate to that community. So your carnivores versus herbivores or, um, you know, a whole different array of, uh, of functional groups. And again, for your community studies, you can also look at habitat use. So these are just some examples of some historic papers that use camera trap data, uh, looking at um, density for species, specific species in um, various different habitat types, looking at species richness, habitat preferences, 
um, studying even studying birds, um, the spatial temporal partitioning between carnivores. So that's that specific functional group. So, you know, there's a variety of different applications when it comes to the data that you collect using um, a camera trap. Um, and yeah, something that I can't um, emphasize enough is the importance of a survey design. So it's incredibly important to standardize your survey protocol across your entire project or whether you're looking at a specific reserve. As I mentioned, your research question or your management um, objectives will dictate this survey protocol. And this might vary depending on what habitat you're um, focusing on, whether you've got a specific target species or a community, or even if you're interested in individual recognition. So some species can easily be recognized in terms of individuals and their um, pelage color or um, patterning. So think of like our um, national or specifically in KZN, we've got a, a leopard study. And for that leopard study, we're trying to um, identify specific individuals to actually look at movement of individuals across our camera trap grid. Um, and therefore these sorts of questions will determine your trap placement, the trap spacing. So the distance between your camera traps the density, so how many traps per square kilometer or per area, and then also the trapping period. So basically how long that camera trap is out collecting data at a single, single time. So there's a variety of different uh, considerations. So whether you're looking at a stratified grid, so having your cameras placed at a specific interdistance, or if you're using a sort of random sampling regime. And, and these regimes tend to be more habitat dependent. So depending on what sort of area you're working in, that will determine um, also whether you use a stratified grid or whether you're using random sampling. Again, your grid size uh, is influenced by the species targeted. So species with larger home ranges tend to use uh, um, would require a larger grid size, but so, so for instance, uh, something with a smaller home range, like a blue diker, you'd use a smaller grid size. Your time frame is also very important. So wet versus dry periods. So we're looking at summer versus uh, winter. So if the species that you're focusing on has a specific breeding season, that's something to, to consider that the, um, for some species, you know, depending on whether they're breeding or not, their home ranges might expand or contract. Also, when you look at um, the positioning and the setup of your camera, so the height and direction that your camera is facing. So if you're targeting uh, a smaller uh, species or perhaps even an overall community, consider placing your camera traps at a lower height because you might be missing some of those smaller crit critters. The direction that the camera's facing is also very important. So you don't want to necessarily at sunrise and sunset only uh, have um, the sunlight triggering the camera. Video versus photo options. Video, having your camera trap set at um, for intervals to take video also takes a lot of battery um, power, large memory, um, memory cards. And then also think about your photo intervals. So there's no point of getting millions of photos of one specific individual walking past the um, camera trap because you're also, you know, using up uh, battery power and space on your SD card. So things like sample size, how many sites, how many cameras, how many trapping nights. So how long is your camera trap going to be um, out in the field? And then also looking at something like a pilot study. So do a little dummy run, um, plot some species accumulation curves to actually see whether you have designed an effective camera trap regime that will uh, answer the, the questions as required. So um, yeah, sort of a bit of reiterating. So thinking about your clear objectives, and these are explicitly linked to science or management. And it also just highlights that uh, importance of um, pilot study and also looking at the literature, seeing and checking what other people have done in the past. 
And, you know, there's a lot of potential for learning from other people's mistakes. So your research questions. So for example, as part of my PhD research, I focused on some research priorities um, in the central and southeast region of um, KZN. And I was interested in looking at patterns and distribution of caracal, blue dica, bushbuck, and red dica. So these are all species with various home range sizes. So overall, I was looking at um, a kind of community-wide um, research question uh, that also encompasses some of the other smaller mesocarnivores that we learned about uh, through Jared's presentation earlier on. So how do we uh, achieve these objectives? Again, I can't emphasize more the standardized survey protocol. So um, think about your statistical model. How are you going to analyze this data? Because that would also speak to your sample size, the number of camera traps that need to be um, deployed. Uh, think about estimates of precision. And these are achieved through replication and independence. So it's just a couple of kind of sort of standard statistical considerations to think about. Um, specifically, um, are we going to look at determining the overall occupancy for species X in a forest or in a similar sort of habitat patch? Um, do we want to compare the levels of site occupancy? So whether the species is present or, present or absence within different habitat types within our study region. So our survey method. Um, sort of traditionally for certain species, we'd consider um, kind of feet on the ground doing potentially something like drive counts or um, dung pile counts, or are we going to use camera traps? So we, when you sort of considering your survey method, you need to think about time and money. And um, so as target species like um, blue dica could be very problematic using some of the more traditional survey techniques because it's a species that is associated with uh, thicker um, habitats, forests, thicket, um, the, you know, anything sort of dense, dense that the species can hide away in. So in terms of the most effective method, camera trapping kind of came up trumps. Um, so in terms of the uh, survey method, the camera traps was the most uh, cost effective and time efficient um, method considering the habitat that we're sampling in. So when we look at the selection of site and sampling units, um, so I mentioned before, uh, non-random placement. So this is could be um, advantageous because it's a lot easier to lay out, um, more convenient way of sampling, but it also doesn't isn't representative of other habitats. So if we randomly placed our camera traps along a road, um, when you think about roads, they could potentially attract or deter species. Roads can be convenient because uh, animals like to use the path of least resistance, but certain species are definitely more deterred by um, vehicle movement and that sort of thing. So you are um, incorporating some biases that you potentially didn't want to include in your study. Also think about your um, sampling area. Um, so as part of my PhD, we covered um, quite a large portion of this sort of coastal belt area from uh, Umtamvuna Reserve as the most southern border all the way up to Umkumas, the Umkumas River. So this was based, this was the idea here was that um, we sampled as many protected areas as possible, um, but also um, to sort of incorporate a variety of different land use types. So thinking about the sampling area would also dictate the length of time required to do your survey and also the number of camera traps that you may require. And so when I speak of a sampling site, what do we mean with a sampling site? So you could have uh, in ecology or in these kind of uh, wildlife studies, you can have a natural definition of a site, which are sort of discrete units. So think of uh, a number of ponds or lakes or individual habitat patches. 
And then also you can have a more arbitrary um, definition of a sampling site. So think of some plot work within a, a specific habitat. So you have these uh, one meter by one meter squares within a forest patch. So that's a sort of traditionally linked to surveying smaller creatures or um, getting sort of finer scale um, vegetation characteristics. In terms of the research that we did, we had um, sites defined as a, a individual camera trap site. So that was our kind of finest um, scale of our study survey. And these individual camera trap sites were embedded within a forest patch. And these forest patches made up parts of a mosaic of uh, patches within a greater study region. So I already showed that the study region um, formed part of the, the Ugu district on southern KZ, uh, in southern KZN. So another sort of more, um, another way of sampling is again, this kind of random placement. You've got ad uh, more advantages in terms of statistical design, you get more scope to represent your study area. Um, and But unfortunately, it could also be logistically a bit more difficult, harder to lay out, and it might not work very well in a, a heterogeneous study area. So when you're looking at um, different sort of habitat classifications within your broader study uh, region. Um, the sampling method that we've employed is a, a sort of stratified um, sampling regime, which does control for heterogeneous um, study areas, uh, gives you um, the potential to estimate the density uh, within the, the uh, strata, and also gives you the opportunity of a more precise estimation of density. The disadvantages, it, it is a more complex design, and it might require a larger um, sample size. And again, this also stresses the important of your, importance of your pilot study to look at whether your survey um, regime is actually effective in um, uh, meeting your objectives. So this is also a sort of example of your stratification. So what is your sampling unit? And basically, um, the way that we laid it out is we created a, a standardized grid. And this grid size uh, is dictated by the home range of your target species or whether you're looking at a community-wide survey. So um, the, the sampling unit is relative to the species of interest. So what I said before is the, the Larger species with larger home ranges would require a, a larger grid and something like a blue diker would require a smaller grid. And by incorporating the smaller grid, you also can then um, get a more uh, effective or a more robust idea of the entire community because you're not just focusing on a larger species, you're encompassing everything. So yeah, we mentioned the site and sampling units. Um, then the next point to consider is the timing and replication. So replication is uh, a kind of uh, encompassed in this uh, little quote by Albert Einstein, where he said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So yeah, that is basically the crux of replication. Um, so there are uh, various types of replication. So you can think of temporal replication. So where you have several repeat visits to sampling sites within a relatively short period of time. So I mentioned before about the importance of the seasonality. So let's think about breeding season when species tend to be more active um, and make sure that it's a closed season. So you're not straddling the breeding and the non-breeding because you don't want to um, bias your data because new individuals have moved into the area. Uh, you can also think about spatial replication. Um, so randomly select a subsample of sites within each sampling unit. Um, and then also in terms of the more traditional survey methods, you can have observer replication. So have several observers go to each site independently, uh, but that's not 
kind of uh, applicable to a camera chat survey. So easy way of kind of setting this out is looking at uh, a GI, looking looking at using GIS to find all your target, whether it be a, a habitat patch, um, compare the size of the patches, the number of patches, and then you can decide on your sample size and your uh, replication, how many, whether you're going to do it over time or in terms of a spatial replication. And then finally, the allocation of survey effort. So um, one size does not fit all. So for a rarer species, you might want more sites, but potentially less intensive. Common species, you don't necessarily require as many camera trap sites, but you can do a more intensive survey. So there's, I've mentioned the, the leopard survey that happens in KZN. The, the sort of standardized um, method in uh, Zululand is a 30-day is a camera trap survey. So these camera traps are deployed for 30 days contiguously um, with a two-kilometer intertrap distance. So each trap is, is two kilometers away from the next. But unfortunately, this regime is not necessarily suitable for all habitats. So when this um, survey type was applied in the southern berg, where the species is um, a lot more rare, the, um, the results weren't as effective. So you might need a, a smaller um, uh, um, survey grid. So you need to include more survey sites, but not necessarily as intensively. So potentially not uh, 30 days. But again, trial and error, and it not one size would fit all habitats even if the species is the same. And I mentioned this kind of survey effort species accumulation curve. So if you are um, diligent and you have a little pilot study, you can plot the number of species that you've encountered. So if it's a community survey across the number of days that the camera traps were out and check whether your graph reaches asymptotes. So that will basically dictate, dictate either the number of days or the number of camera trap sites that would be required for you to reach the optimum number of um, species within your, your survey. Okay, so this is also um, a paper that was published by a, a friend of ours who was looking at camera trapping for mammals in the Cape Floristic region. And he also emphasized the importance of effort spacing and trap placement. So he basically used three different uh, regimes, three different um, grid sizes. So basically looking at the, the camera trap density and uh, how that would influence the, um, the number of captures or the species that are uh, captured within that survey grid. So oh, yeah, he had uh, a nine camera grid array, a four camera grid array, and a 25 camera grid array. And basically, um, this is also kind of highlights the, the importance of your um, pilot study to see, you know, at which, at which time frame do you actually reach the asymptote based on the number of camera traps uh, within your placement. And it's quite interesting that the four camera uh, grid almost reached um, the 10 uh, number or whatever uh, at a sort of different rates to the other, other camera trap placements. But it's just interesting to, to look at how your survey effort um, and depending on the number of camera traps within your grid could actually influence the, the time that a, a camera trap needs to be um, placed out in the field. So when we look at um, what type of cameras, um, again, it's also driven by research question, but also uh, the budget. Um, Money is always tight, so I suppose we have a wish list of things that we'd ideally want, but uh, in reality, that's not always possible. Um, so something to consider is something like photo quality, specifically if you're trying to capture individuals. So 
for something like uh, the leopard survey, where they're interested in um, identifying individuals by the spots. If you've got um, poor photo quality, you might not um, meet those kind of targets. Think about the camera size and the weight, particularly if you're going to be um, deploying lots of cameras on foot in very treacherous terrain. Um, again, if you've got your ideal uh, survey regime, uh, what, what, how does the camera perform in terms of battery life and capacity? So certain camera traps can't take uh, SD cards above um, a certain uh, size. So that's definitely something, something to consider. Also, some of the camera traps, the latest makes and models, um, suggest that you use the high lithium, those lithium fancy batteries that are incredibly expensive and, and very long lasting. Um, but if you don't use those and you, you potentially use um, standard uh, reusable batteries, which is definitely more envi environmentally friendly and budget friendly, the camera might not perform in the same way. Um, detection range. Um, because a camera trap uh, is, is triggered by a species, not all camera traps are made equally. Some would uh, be able to detect something moving within like 15 meters or so. So yeah, it, it, most specs now will give you the information about the detection range. So this is basically the distance from the camera at which the, the, the animal is likely to be detected and then subsequently triggers for, to take a photo. Field of view, um, so basically whether you're looking at um, the degree um, in front of the, the camera lens that it can capture. Some cameras are quite fancy and they might uh, have a, a broader range, but usually it is between 35 and 45 degrees. Um, the type of lens also, whether you're um, looking at infrared, so you have this passive infrared sensor, that would um, detect change in um, and not only just for the movement detection, but also change in temperature. Um, these camera traps also come with a variety of different flash types, incandescent, so you know, bright white flashes, which tends to be the standard for, for leopard surveys now, because you at night when the species is potentially more active, you want to capture. Um, the, the patterns to be able to um, differentiate between individuals. You also get these LED um, lights uh, and also infrared or black light. So these lights, these flashes give enough, um, illuminate enough to capture um, a photo in low light, but it also means that the camera is not that detectable by species. So black light means that you won't even see the, 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 the red glow of uh, infrared. So that's potentially something to consider in areas where there's uh, high poaching incidents where you don't necessarily want, um, you know, a big white flash to um, indicate that there's a camera trap nearby. Again, when we look at the field setup for surveys, um, you need to make sure if you're using reusable um, batteries that you've got enough charges. You can get um, bank, these back bank charges where you can charge eight or more batteries at a time. I've already briefly touched on the batteries, whether you, it's reusable or um, those fancy schmancy expensive ones. Um, also, something that um, might not be uh, as obvious, but uh, is a GPS, because you want to make sure that you know exactly where that camera trap is, um, not just for in terms of deployment, but also I will discuss a little bit later on in terms of um, geo-referencing your site for analysis. So uh, location in the field, I mentioned already about um, the direction so that you don't get direct sunlight at uh, sunset and sunrise and sunset, uh, whether you're going to be using trails or not. Again, um, a bit more human activity around trails, but also, again, this will be um, dictated by your re uh, research question. Um, and location, but something to always bear in mind is um, is safety. So whether your camera is safe and whether you as a person is also, whether you're safe in the field or not. 
uh, distance to uh, focal point, so your area where you're going to potentially be capturing your photos. Again, this is dependent on that range that the camera um, the camera track camera can um, detect and take a photo of the target species. Height above ground, which is also dependent on the community. As I mentioned before, if you want to encompass everything, slightly lower down gives you uh, potentially uh, further distance on the ground where you can capture your smaller mesocarnivores. And hopefully, um, you know, when it comes to the larger species, uh, you know, they, are, they tend to be easily identified based on sock colors when you're looking at different antelope. And hopefully if it's something like an elephant, uh, people would be able to identify or distinguish between an elephant and a zebra, um, even if only a small portion of uh, the body is available. Um, things like security, I spoke about safety of the deployment, the, you know, the people are deploying, but also big five, so safety from dangerous game. Um, personal safety you need to consider um, and common sense. And in terms of the theft, I mean, camera traps are expensive. We um, put a lot of time and money into these surveys. So we want to make sure that um, every camera is uh, retrievable. So most camera traps you can purchase a, a lock box for, where you can have uh, a bike wire or a, a combination lock to be able to access the camera. And most cameras are very well camouflaged now as well. So now down to the sort of data capturing. So when I mentioned this stratified grid, so each um, point within the grid is geo-referenced using our uh, GPS. And we have our sites within this specific uh, reserve. And then our um, number of camera trap nights. And then obviously all the information that comes from the individual photo. So at the, the bare minimum for uh, this specific survey, we can say whether a species was present or absent at a site on a specific day. So that is perhaps um, one of the most uh, sort of simple ways of uh, capturing your data for a specific species. And so, uh, as I said before, data capturing is not just linked to photographs. We have a lot of metadata that goes along with your, with your camera trap survey. So your spatial reference, which is that specific GPS point um, linked to where the camera is deployed. You've got information about the grid size and the stratification. Um, also, the information that comes from the camera is your is the date and time, and you've obviously uh, carefully planned your survey so you know what the season is that you're conducting the survey in, as well as the survey length. So, and then little bits of information about your camera trap setup, so the time delay in between um, taking a photograph or a video, and also the height above ground. Basically, this information is important so that if anyone else wants to replicate that survey, in addition to being able to use the data for analysis, it needs to be replicable. Replicable, and this is some. This is sort of data standards that are also used for publications. So, if you want to publish your data in a manuscript, these are some of the bare minimals that are required. This is also something that we touched on in the camera trapping best practice um, protocols for uh, surveying within Ezenvelo KZN wildlife reserves. Um, again, what uh, the data that you capture also links to your research question. So a, a, a photo on its own means nothing without the explanatory variables, the things that kind of informs the reason why you you found that species on that day at that specific camera trap site. So what are you going to relate your camera trap data to? So for our surveys, we look at a habitat profile. Um, we heard about uh, the sort of patches and how there's a lot of camera, a lot of um, canopy cover. 
but not all, let's say, okay, what your server is in, in forest patches, which is what predominantly what my uh, research was based on. Not all uh, forests are made equally. So when you look at um, uh, uh, imagery from, from the air, you've got closed canopy, but it's the nitty gritty that goes on on the ground that would potentially influence whether a species is present or absent. So this speaks directly to your habitat profile, what is available to species at the micro habitat scale. So basically in that camera shot with the, the species present, what makes the, the structures different to structures at the next site. Then also look at your landscape scale information. So what goes on in the surrounding matrix, information like uh, water levels, is there um, access to streams or rivers or um, uh, lakes or dams, um, information about the rainfall and the temperature. And then also simple things like, was your camera trap placed on a game trail or on a road or on a human path? Um, and, you know, it might seem arbitrary, but those sorts of information, as I mentioned before, when you're selecting your sites, um, would also um, influence whether that species was present or absent. So this kind of metadata or additional information we can refer to as your covariates, your predictors, or your variables. Basically, you know, the information that goes with that camera trap image to explain why that species was there on that given time and given day and given site. So we could have something like continuous variables, which is um, things like ranges of patch sizes, your tree canopy cover, a distance to water source or so something in meters, the overall forest cover, um, things like prey encounter rate, if you're looking at um, uh, large carnivores, and then information like the temperature or the humidity. Then we can also have categorical uh, predictors, which might link to your specific habitat type or subtype. So if you're looking at a broader area where you might have different subclassifications for, this, for forests, and then also specifically something like the study site. So categorical would be Umtambuna Nature Reserve versus Orobi Gorge Nature Reserve. Um, you can also have a binary variables. So something like the presence or the absence of a competitive species. So when you're looking at competition between primates or competition between mesocarnivores, the presence and absence of cattle, um, you know, lots of areas have a lot of pressure from cattle grazing. And then also uh, in terms of prey items for carnivores or predators. So if you're looking at factors in influencing um, the presence of herbivores, the presence of a predator could also influence um, that, that sort of species being captured at a specific camera trap site. Um, we can also have something that is linked to your um, specific site, so your habitat type, your disturbance level, again, distance to water, or even elevation, because differences in elevation could also influence whether certain species are presence, present or absent. Um, variables that are linked to your overall sampling regime, so your time of sampling the observer, which is not necessarily um, uh, applicable to a camera trap survey, but you could potentially have uh, for uh, a sampling area or between sampling areas, you could have different camera trap um, makes and models. And as I said before, the distance, the firing distance of the camera trap can vary. So that could also potentially be um, something that you need to consider in terms of the variables that will inform the, the capture of a, a species on the camera trap. So for our study area where we had these specific um, camera trap sites within habitat patches, within the greater landscape, we collected data on the microhabitat conditions, so that foliage profile at the immediate camera trap site, 
We looked at overall patch characteristics, so the size of the patch, the forest patch, distance between forest patches, and then also the greater region. So what is each forest patch surrounded by? Um, and then, you know, things like uh, anthropogenic disturbance factors, the presence or absence of people and dogs and cattle. So a variety of different explanatory variables that would speak to those individual images that we capture on a camera trap. So here's an example of some of the um, specific uh, covariates. So I mentioned um, the fragmentation metrics, so looking at the, the patch characteristics. So the size of an individual forest patch versus the distance between forest patches, um, a land cover classification. So depending on the size of your um, hammer trap grid, you can pull out a classification either surrounding your overall patch or around your camera trap site. Um, and then the finer scale habitat char characteristics, which is going to be a, at a smaller radius, where you're taking information like the percentage um, leaf cover, <clears throat> cover, grass cover, uh, information about shrub and herb foliage cover, tree stem density, the canopy cover, canopy height, you know, everything that would make a specific camera trap small scale site potentially different from, from its neighbor. And also that, that kind of bit of uh, kind of information that you can pull out from desktop is things like um, your GPS data that you logged in the field. Um, and you know that you, you can use that to create your camera trap maps. You can use Google Earth Pro to um, create polygons around your patches or just simply use uh, something like the latest GeoTerra image land cover data, which differentiates between different habitat types, but also links it to a specific land use. So whether it is um, agricultural or urban or residential or commercial, um, depending on the areas that you survey. So this is just an example of our um, specific covariates that we used for a lot of our surveys. So we had these the, the patch size, um, the per, um, percentage of other habitat types that surround our um, survey sites. And then again, the, the kind of micro habitat scale things that were linked to on the ground, what we saw in and around the camera trap site. So yeah, like I mentioned, the amount of leaf litter, grass cover, and then stem density of different trees. So other additional information that we collected around these camera trap sites was um, species composition of plants. So if you're just interested in the woody composition, looking at um, the different tree species and collating like a, a list of tree species present at each site. So over replication, you'll get an idea of how a particular forest patch is different in terms of the on the ground stratification and the profile, but also information about the actual tree species or plant species present. And you can also relate that to, you know, the information on the camera trap. A little bit about archiving and storing. Um, there's a lot of uh, different packages that um, people are using, and this is always ever changing. Um, I recommend doing a little bit of research in terms of what might be the most um, applicable to you. Um, I think since I put this um, slide together, there has been so many different um, new methods, and there's um, specific uh, research groups that are looking at um, AI and auto recognition of species. And so basically just look at your what suits your needs. Um, very basically for me, I used uh, uh, um, spreadsheets and, you know, you can link those Excel spreadsheets through an access database and make it relational. So you can have your 
uh, GIS data stored in a, ge in a geo database, and then your individual camera trap information on spreadsheets and have a, a key that links the, um, the geo reference data to, to the species information, and then subsequently to your kind of habitat fine scale profile data as well. Uh, something that I really found very useful is the um, this kind of uh, ex data extractor, which helps you to pull out information from a camera trap, like the photo number and the date and time. So if you um, set up your camera traps, you set them all up to um, this exactly the same date and time, because it's an absolute nightmare if you come to a camera trap and you realize that it's out of sync with the rest of your camera traps. Um, and then for each photo captured, the camera in the same way that any other digital camera um, allocates a photo number, that photo number, date and time can be extracted using something like this um, BR software's um, data extracted tool. And that makes data entry retrospectively quite a lot easier. Also, when it comes to archiving your data or storing your data, camera tap data can take a lot of um, hard drive space. So um, photo comp compressing um, tools is a lot available on the internet. I used Fastone photo resizer, so I could just um, take an entire um, folder at a time and resize the photos for, um, for archiving retrospectively. And then small touching on some of the analysis or the applications. Um, I mentioned uh, occupancy modeling. So this could be a single species, single season uh, modeling um, that gives you the, the occupancy rate and also the detection rate for a species. Um, packages like Presence, um, which is a freestanding package with a little uh, kind of GUI interface so you can manually input your information or something like Unmarked in R where you use the R script um, to run the data. Uh, some another uh, occupant example of an occupancy model is a species interaction. So for this, we also we used presence and we looked at the interaction or the sort of competitive exclusion between two species. So for example, we used um, bushbuck and nyala. Um, nyala are considered um, a species that could outcompete bushbuck depending on um, the habitat. So we had the information about those, those two species. We had information about the habitat that they were present in. And then we also had information about um, potential predators and then also other species that uh, influence uh, the habitat. So uh, in, the, in our case, uh, in um, Northern KZN, we looked at the presence of elephants as uh, ecosystem engineers. So this, this was a nice kind of uh, species interaction um, analysis, also just simply using um, uh, camera trap data and a freestanding uh, package called presence. Then there's also um, multi-species occupancy. So you can um, run that in bugs and uh, jags. Those are the sort of two um, packages required in R to run the, the analysis, but that is slightly more kind of advanced um, types of analysis. So if you're initially running a camera trap survey, it might be easiest to just start off with your occupancy modeling and then kind of build on that. You can also do population estimates using mark uh, recapture. Uh, you, can do, you can do this also in R. Um, temporal analysis, so looking at the activity pattern. So we, if you want to see whether in a specific area there's differences in terms of when a species is most active. So think of those sort of deal phases where some species are nocturnal, depending on disturbances in an area. Um, and that can be done also in some free software called Oriana or in overlap in R. Um, you can also look at habitat selection, how a species specifically uh, utilizes a portion of an area um, above and beyond um, other habitats or available habitats within, within a, a specific area. 
Um, so yeah, this is just a little kind of diagram to show, um, you know, whether you just want to do a species inventory, so presence, absence, looking at abundance, community analysis, distribution and behaviours, uh, and basically what kind of um, analysis you can do and what packages um, you would require or kind of software that you would require to be able to, to do that specific type of analysis. Um, yeah, just some uh, links, and I will uh, make this uh, presentation available as a um, PDF so that you can access this information. So just where you can download data and um, packages and things like that to be able to analyze your data. So just a very quick, just to finish off um, our overall big survey, we covered um, a large intact uh, forest patches, and then looked at um, sort of this kind of intermediate uh, forest. And back then from the land cover data, it was referred to as coastal thicket and dense bush. And I think the most recent land cover update refers to it as low canopy forest. So looking at kind of old growth versus regenerative forest types within a, a matrix of different land use types. So a mixture of urban and agriculture. So you've seen this before, our camera traps were um, standardized, had a, um, were, each camera trap was geo-referenced. We use a standardized grid. Each camera trap was set to 20 to 30 cent centimeters from the ground. We preset the date and time and set it to a 30 second motion triggered delay setting. We spaced them specifically on a tree to avoid direct glare, and the camera traps were deployed for 21 survey days at a time. So these camera traps were run for 24 hours at a time. And this survey was very um, uh, kind of designed so that in a, a, a full month, we could have enough time to run a survey and to collect and de deploy the next set of, set of cameras. So what I also have to add is for this survey, we had 30 individual camera traps. They were all the same make and model. And because these cameras were deployed um, all in all together for 21 survey days at a time, we could then what we call leapfrog the camera trap. So when we move on to our next reserve or patch or whatever, it would happen in the next month. So that's why it's important to know the, the date and the time and the season that you're working in. So this survey was also done in both what we consider the wet and the dry season. Um, and each survey was, a, was a considered a closed season so that there's no influx of individuals, you know, um, when there's breeding or anything like that occurring. So these camera traps, um, in addition to taking the date and time, also take information about the moon phase. So that's something that's interesting. So if you're looking at studying nocturnal species, um, I mentioned um, those activity patterns. So you can link activity patterns to specific moon phases. So is something more active or less active during a specific moon phase? So like when it's new moon or full moon or whatever. So from each individual photo, there's potential to be able to, in, in addition to identifying your species, um, if you're very familiar with your species, you could then start aging and actually sexing um, the individuals. Sexing for certain species might be more difficult than others. But again, it depends on whether you are interested in looking at um, the distribution of, of age ranges or different sexes across your survey area. So we look at both sp spatial and temporal pat patterns. So this is occupancy modeling. So whether a site was occupied, so whether a species was present or absent at a specific camera trap site. And then also looking at these activity patterns and specific deal phase selection. Uh, the, um, from one data set, we published um, four manuscripts, 
And that was only possible because the data was, uh, and the survey was completely standardized. So the first question linked to those microhabitat structures based on the foliage profile that we took around each camera trap site. But yeah, the habitat characteristics. And then from this data set, we could look at which characteristic was specifically linked to which species. So you can do a comparison between blue diker, for example, and bushbuck, and how their occupancy varied depending on the specific habitat type that you um, focused on, or the microhabitat or these kind of um, fine scale characteristics present within each forest or within each study site. Next one was looking more at um, the landscape and the urban agricultural mosaic that surrounded our um, survey sites. Again, this was information that was take, taken from um, land cover information and also things like information um, based on road density or um, human population density that can be um, extracted through Statistics South Africa. Again, here, same two species, and we looked at how the human population density influenced um, one and the other, how the different management regimes, so whether a forest patch was present within or owned uh, by um, in farmland, whether it was in a protected area or whether it was in an urban or residential area, and how these differ between different species. Um, and then it's that kind of looking at the specific deal phases and the spatial temporal distribution. So for this, we focused on um, the four antelope species and how they were influenced by the presence of caracal, jackal, domestic dogs, and humans. So again, here, simple um, looking at occupancy modeling and looking at how these different um, explanatory variables uh, explained the differences between the different antelope species and cancer. Again, here gives you an example of their activity patterns. So looking at differences between blue and red diker in terms of their activity peak activities, when were they more active? Was it at dawn versus dusk? Did it vary between different land use types? So somewhere that is um, less disturbed, they might have um, more traditional um, activity patterns very depending on, or you know, something like if it's an incredibly urbanized area, the activity patterns might shift to be more nocturnal. Uh, and then we also looked at the overall community, so encompassing uh, basically every mammal present within our study areas, um, and then looked at how um, these characteristics, forest patch characteristics, actually influenced the species richness and the, the diversity found within. So this paper was a little bit like um, explaining the island by the island biogeography theory within um, our kind of mixed land use mosaic um, that surround our forest patches in southern KZN. Using that same um, kind of uh, data, we can also then individually look at how the number of patches or um, patch size could potentially influence a specific species. So here again, my example individuals is the um, individual example species, blue diker and bushbuck, and how the um, different characteristics of the patches could potentially influence uh, their occupancy within our study area. Then finally, just how um, the camera trap data gets um, utilized. So for private landowners, it's incredibly useful to have species inventory so that they know what's going on on their properties. But also this data was fed directly into the red list assessments for 2016. And this was for some mango monkey, um, blue diker, red diker, bush pig. And then also the um, 
blue jacket information also went a little bit further in um, speaking to the non-detrimental findings for the species in South Africa. So this basically speaks directly to things like hunting quotas and um, management plans if people do intend to hunt a species, this specific species on a property. So um, it was sort of quite successful because we had for the first time a, a better idea in terms of where the species were um, utilizing areas more frequently than others. And yeah, subsequently we could speak to changing some of the, the red list um, assessments uh, for specifically for red diker in this instance. Okay, and I think I have spoken enough and I think I might have also gone over time, but yeah, I think, I don't know if we're gonna be leaving questions right until the end, um, but yeah, I will leave it there and I'll be happy to take some questions as and when. Yvette, thank you so much. That was, yeah, it was really comprehensive and I found it incredibly interesting. I'm sure other colleagues, colleagues did as well. Um, yeah, definitely take some questions now if there are any. I, I do have a couple, um, but yeah, I'll open, open the floor and has anyone got any questions for Yvette? Um, okay, Yvette, I wouldn't mind asking a couple if that's all right. Um, so, uh, let me just see the first one. Yeah. So um you've obviously focused, yeah, you know, the, the a lot of the studies were on, on forest systems. Um just kind of looking at a, a practical well, issue, the problem statement that we we're dealing with at the moment is that if you look at our Cato Ridge grasslands, which are a, an area that we focus on a lot in terms of trying to um, increase our conservation footprint within there. Um there's a lot of secondary grassland systems as well as our kind of primary case in sense and cell flock grasslands. Um, and there's historic records of RB on those sites. Um, but obviously, given extensive urban transformation um, and pressure on those sites, we are unsure if they are still there um, and you know what numbers, etc. Um, what are some of the things that uh, in terms of approaching the design of, of just purely a kind of presence absence study um, in picking up that species, what are the kind of things that you would need to look at um, if you had to apply you know, some of the work that you've, that you've done um, in terms of designing a project there? Obviously, given it's quite a fragmented landscape um, and quite urbanized, so it'd be, um, and, and, it's, and in many cases, open grass in the system. So obviously, you know, theft and things like that of, of, of cameras are going to be potential issue i don't know any any kind of thoughts on on that yeah story? um yeah like I, I said before everything is very kind of context specific so um i think that initially just start with a um and i'm sure you've got all of this already so have your uh a gi gis kind of map in terms of looking at what the the habitat the size of the habitat that's available the um uh the composition relative to each other. So I don't know whether you're looking at one contiguous patch or several patches that there's potential to interlink. Um, so for something like this, I think it would be important, you know, we can sit down, we can look at um, the different factors and we can design a, a, a specific grid that would meet the, meet the needs. The grasslands are a bit more difficult and in the sense that you have to time it also because when it comes to um, uh, management, you know, we burn specific times of year and then you also have the non-target burns where, I don't know about you guys, but for a lot of the more Southern reserves, the arson fires that you, you just can't control when what time of the season that happens. So seasonality would be something to consider, but definitely the 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 size of the area and the the kind of overall connectivity between patches, the shape of the patch, the, and yeah, things like um, the home range. How how big a home range do RB use? And again, that might also be difficult to answer because um, you know, as I said before, with 
leopard, depending on where it is, they might have different home ranges. So those are sort of things that we need to consider in terms of planning, and that would also dictate the number of camera traps that you need. So grass and um, surveys, you uh, have a, a heavy stake that you um, kind of uh, bash into the ground for want of a better word, but it also means that those cameras are more visible to um, people and if you've got hunting pressure or even you know herdsmen or people that can come and interfere with your camera traps, it does make it a lot harder. But yeah, if if that's something that you uh, have on your wish list, maybe we can get together and have a look at the site, sort of site composition and um, yeah, work out a, a, a species specific plan for for Oribe in those areas. Brilliant, thanks. Yeah, I'll definitely take you up on that. On that, I appreciate that. Um, Bega, so you've got your hand raised. Go for it. Uh, sorry, Cam, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. You. Sorry, because the feed I'm getting is badly broken, but it's fine if you can hear me. Dr. Yvette, thank you very much for such an enlightening uh, presentation. Um, just before the break, Errol asked a question which I would regard as a top-down way he asked about the impact of social activities on some of the populations that you guys um, are, mon are monitoring. And uh, needless to say, there's a great, there's a lot of data that is coming through from uh, tra uh, camera tra trapping. Now, my question is, it's actually a bottom up. To what extent does data from ca camera trapping inform your national uh, databases like your SANBI species data, where in some cases we might have thought that a certain species probably has gone extinct, but the camera traps have proved or demonstrated that that species is actually still in existence. And, and, and secondly, to what extent does it inform your impact assessment reports in as far as your develop, develop, developments are concerned, not only to prove that the, the issue of presence absence uh, uh, element, but also to uh, uh, highlight what habitats and, and, and biological corridors that might get fragmented as a result of, 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 of developments. Thanks. Thank you, Becca. We actually had um, back in 2018 as part of the FBIP, the Foundation Biodiversity Information Program, um, we had a whole session on um, camera traps uh, at Cape St. Francis. And the, the idea is that a, 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 an image um, derived from camera trap can become something similar to you know, it can have an ascension number in the same way that a, a specimen, um, inf that specimen information from a museum or, you know, it, it is, it's essentially the same kind of part of, oh, sorry, I'm getting a real feedback. I don't know if you, other people can hear that. Okay. I think that's better. Um, yeah, so in the same way that uh, a, a physical specimen can get lodged at a museum, uh, an image, if it's a good quality image with all the relevant metadata, so the GPS information, date, time, and all the other, um, you know, data that I've, I've discussed, um, is it is just as good as a, a as a museum specimen. Now the issue in terms of um, curating this information and linking it to something like Sambi's databases is exactly that. We don't have a, a a database at the moment that has the capacity to deal with all of this information. So this is potentially something that is in the um, is going to be incorporated in the future um, and how Sambi manages uh, camera trap information. Because at the moment, like if uh, if someone has um, funding through some something like the National Research Foundation, the information actually has to be um, archived and kept. So it's a lot of data that's, that's kind of lying around on hard drives and are supposedly being curated by NRF. But all of that information can be fed into a main um, database that could inform all of these red list assessments and everything else in the future. And it can almost become sort of semi-automated. 
Um, so yeah, so that was your one question and I can't remember what the second question was. Yes. No, the second part was actually about um, the camera trap data informing um, impact assessment reports to, inf to inform development. Um, yes, it can do. Um, I suppose some people are still relying on walking sites and looking at full um, scats and whatever else. But yeah, this is is the least biased and the least intrusive. So um, a long time ago, I used to um, consult for a company in the Eastern Cape. And, you know, if I had uh, uh, camera traps, I think I would have been able to give a far better idea of the species present at a site. So I think when you, um, you know, you want to put together these kind of um, uh, species lists that go with your plants and whatever, and birds and whatever else, I think there's a lot of stuff that's being missed by not having, uh, you know, a camera trap survey. So you can go to a site and you can on that specific day, you might see evidence of X, Y, and Z, but it'll ne never give you a complete um, idea. But yeah, again, for, for those sorts of things, it needs to be something that is, uh, is standardized. You need to be able to um, give that the information linked to that survey to be able to inform um, an impact assessment. So I suppose in the same way that um, everything else is standardized, I suppose if you have access to cameras and you can say that this was your specific regime, then it's first prize uh, gold standard in, in my opinion. But yeah, it's definitely a, a tool that can be used to better inform those kind of um, impact assessments. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Zubet. Uh, thanks, Gaga. Um, I've got one more question for you, if that's all right. Um, just on when you actually deploy the, the cameras, um, in terms of the impact of the activities of actually placing the cameras there, disturbance created, scent left behind, et cetera, how does that impact? I mean, obviously, I'm imagining it would be species specific. But if you had to take something like blue darker as an example, um, is there any indication of the impact of, of that activity um, on, you know, on behavior and as a result of that, how long cameras should be deployed for at a minimum um, in order to get rid of that, that potential impact on your, on your data? Yeah, that's a good question. It also like, it depends. Um, so I'm just looking at one lot of, uh, one specific reserve um, and, on the first day at the first three sites, the, the first individual that we captured was a blue diker. So I think it depends on, and then for some of the others on the second day. So yeah, I think it um, also depends on um, the specific site. Um, yeah, the disturbance. You can't necessarily say, okay, it's the scent left behind that um, meant that the species didn't um, visit that site for the first three days. So you have to actually look at the specific site characteristics and what makes that site different to the others. You can't um, pull out just one uh, variable and say, this is, you know, it was a human scent that meant that we didn't capture them for the first three days because it, it, it varies so much across all the different sites. So that's only something that you can say retrospectively once you've collected all your data and you've got, um, you know, all the information about other people that were potentially on the camera trap site, you know, like photos of people or photos of predators or, yeah. So, and I'm sure for some species, um, it will actually attract. I know genets were always very intrigued by our camera traps and quite often they would scent mark them as well. So at sites where there was a lot of genet activity, it just like those cameras just smelled like buttered popcorn for weeks on end. So yeah, again, it is species, Specific, but also very context specific. So it depends on on what would have meant the, the factors that would have uh, precluded or excluded them in the first place as well. So yeah, that is that is a very sort of complex thing to try and tease out. Sure. No, cool. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, a bit. Thank you. Thank you for that. I thought that was uh, really informative. I think everyone got a lot out of that. So 
appreciate your appreciate your time. Um, Thank you. If you don't mind, I think we're going to move on to on to David, um, and he's going to be David. Are you online and ready to go? Yes, he is. I'm just going to okay. unmute and through. do all of my stuff as well because we're on in the same office but on different computers. So I just want to try and avoid any uh, feedback and yeah. whatever else. Okay, for sure. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, thanks and, and welcome. And uh, David's going to be presenting on the value of bycatch data. So, yeah, looking forward to that. Thanks, David. Over to you. Uh, sorry, we were just on the switch over there. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I got you. Okay, great. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, hopefully that's now clear. Okay, uh, yeah, good morning, colleagues and Bonani. Um, thank you to um, Cameron and Freshney for putting this together and the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, something that's not potentially always considered uh, during camera trap survey design, but actually um, opening up a wealth of other applications um, and um, all the kind of biological and ecological and conservation information we can glean from a camera trap survey that we didn't perhaps immediately consider um, during the, the design of the targets. So this is that of bycatch. Um, so species that we're capturing on the camera traps, we weren't necessarily actually um, considering we would capture, but actually we might not be able to um, inform some conservation or management or any other sort of um, ecological frameworks that we might be interested in. So um, this is just an example um, of how uh, this may be applied to relevant data sets. Um, and I'm just going to talk specifically on two case studies that, um, that we did. Um, these papers are published if you're interested. So one is um, in forest ecology and management, and that's on the uh, spotted ground thrush. And the other one is in African zoology, and that's on the lemon dove. So if you're interested, you can go find these papers. Um, so as I mentioned, bycatch data is basically species um, that are being recorded by the camera traps that weren't the initial target of the survey. Um, the eligibility and our ability to um, actually glean and analyze and produce results from these data are dependent upon certain factors. Um, and this is things such as camera trap placements, um, as Yvette's already mentioned, the location of the camera in terms of heights um, will dictate what sort of species and what kind of animals are being captured. Um, so if the uh, survey design is one of a generalized community and you're getting a lot of things um, in the background that you perhaps wouldn't be with a specific um, camera trap design at a certain height, this immediately opens it up to the wider community of species that we perhaps wouldn't be targeting with our um, initial survey. Again, the original survey design um, and the assumptions, um, which is taken by the proposed, proposed research question, um, sorry, um, this has to be applicable to bycatch uh, species. Um, and we also have to think about our bycatch sample size. Again, um, we have assumptions about uh, data analyses based on adequate sample size. So again, just because we've caught one or two species um, in the periphery doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be eligible for analysis through the bycatch data. Um, and as Yvette's uh, spoken about at length, replicability, robustness, um, these are two very key uh, considerations for um, assessing whether our bycatch species can actually be analyzed and, and, and taken forward for something useful. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is uh, simply a case study to illustrate the potential. Um, and these two species are two reclusive terrestrial forest birds, um, the spotted ground thrush and the lemon dove. The survey design um, was that of the mammalian community in the Indian Ocean Coastal Belt Forest between Umtambuna and Umkomas, as Yvette um, explained already. Um, and our assumptions to start with were that it was a closed survey. So we had discrete farms between the breeding season and the non-breeding season. Um, so immigration and emigration of individuals was 
presumably get to um, a minimum. Um, the survey design was generalized for the whole community. The camera trap placement was um, such that it would capture the full range of uh, species present. Um, the design was assumed to be replicable, um, and indeed we did re repeat it between the two um, wet and dry seasons, um, and long term because it spanned both seasons. Um, and that our explanatory covariates, which again Yvette talked about, um, are going to be appropriate for um, and complementary for applying to our bycatch species in the background as well. So uh, just to give a little backdrop um, to this, of course, we're all fully aware that uh, human population is kind of out of control, and this is putting huge pressure um, on natural resources, natural wild spaces, habitats, as habitats being converted, um, and resources being extracted, etc. And in the context of the Indian Ocean Coastal Belt Forest, we're seeing um, the transformation of the indigenous um, forests, which is resulting in significant changes in biodiversity that inhabit these forests. Um, and although our forests are naturally fragmented and exist within a uh, embedded mosaic of grassland and other habitat types, with human um, anthropogenic change of the landscapes, we're also seeing anthropogenic fragmentation of forest landscapes, and this isn't a random process. This is being driven by commercial transformation, agriculture and forestry and urbanization. Um, and when we talk about fragmentation, we're talking about the changes in diversity and abundance of specialized structures, resources, and the concomitant niches um, therein within those forest habitats. This in turn creates changes in species richness and abundance, changes the community assemblages, and we often see a decline in specialist species. Um, and fragmentation specifically decreases um, connectivity between patches and gene flow of individuals between patches. It increases edge habitats, so the um, homogenization of um, sort of internal structures that are more complex in the forest are being homogenized um, along the edges of the forest, and this is also leading them uh, more vulnerable to invasions by um, alien plants and um, other animal species that perhaps wouldn't have gotten into the forest otherwise. So with that bit of backdrop on why this is um, important, uh, we can apply it to these two species that are inhabiting these forests that are under the anthropogenic uh, pressures. The first one is the spotted brown thrush, um, Geocula dutata. Um, and this species is distributed across Africa um, in five different subspecies, but the one that we have here on the um, on the coast um, eastern seaboard is endangered and endemic to this region, um, and it's only located uh, along the um, salt and coastal forests of Kaysedan and um, the sort of wild coast area of Eastern Cape. And then we have the um, lemon dove, uh, also known as the cinnamon dove, Aplopelia lavatus. Um, this is widespread across the continent, uh, but it's a very reclusive um, and very shy species. And um, neither of these species responded particularly well. So um, during my first postdoc, I did um, complementary bird surveys along with Yvette's PhD research um, with camera trapping at the same sites. And these were two species that were present, but just didn't really show up um, with the fixed radius point count um, survey methods that we were doing for the birds. So they became good candidates for um, being able to investigate their ecological and conservation parameters via camera trap data because they showed up um, a lot more frequently. So as I mentioned, the brown thrush is um, globally endangered. Uh, distribution status of both species are poorly in, understood in the um, critically endangered Indian Ocean Coast Belt Forest. Um, and as I mentioned, these forests are under um, anthropogenic pressure. We've lost at least 70% of the um, Indian Ocean Coast Belt Forest, and it's being, uh, the remnant patches are being fragmented um, within this mosaic of different land use uh, types. 
So our main objective, um, the spotted ground thrush, was to establish the non-breeding season habitat patch occupancy in southern Queensland, and this is because this species undertakes uh, partial migration um, during the non-breeding season, and all individuals are present in the coastal forests um, in the eastern seaboard during the breeding season. Um, southern populations move into the eastern Cape and northern populations move from the, um, from the coast into the inland scarp forests around places like Ngoya, um, Linda, and Mani, that sort of area. Um, so we were specifically focused on the um, non-breeding winter season. And we wanted to examine habitat requirements and the species response to fragmentation effects and the surrounding land use. And for Lemon Dove, our main um, objective was to establish this active site occupancy, um, examine its habitat requirements and its tolerance to disturbance. And because this species is uh, resident year round, we're able to establish any seasonal, or we aim to establish any seasonal differences in its occupancy and the drivers of um, its occupancy. So this um, camera trap regime placed between June 2014 and May 2016. Um, as Yvette mentioned, the camera traps were deployed over 21 survey days, 24 hours a day, with 30 second trigger interval across three different habitat types, coastal scarp forest, coastal lowland forest, and coastal dense bush, which is now um, recognized as uh, low indigenous forest, um, sort of indicative of regenerating coastal forest. Um, and also across four management regimes, um, so within nature reserves, within residential areas, forest patches on farms and forest patches within eco estates. As already mentioned, I'm not gonna to get too much into this. We already know we had a stratified 400 meter by 400 meter grid size um, where we placed our cameras and within a 20 meter fixed radius at each camera, we examined and recorded microhabitat characteristics such as leaf litter, bare ground, um, sapling and, and uh, seedling, uh, recruitment, um, stem density of trees of different heights, all that kind of thing. And then for all the um, broader scale resolution, the land cover classifications, we placed a one kilometer buffer around each patch, uh, around each camera rather, and we quantified the percentage of each different land of a type within that buffer. Um, and then we had our um, fragmentation matrix, uh, metrics, which were the actual raw hectareage of patch size of each patch and the isolation distances. So the difference distance between um, the patches and the relation to the distance between um, said patch and what we call the mainland forest, which are our largest um, forest patches in the region. And we used a single season occupancy model um, using the standalone presence um, software and just basically, as it's touched on, uh, we're looking at site occupancy, site occupancy with this little um, symbol here, uh, Psi. Um, and that's just basically the probability that a site is occupied. And then our detection probability is the second output we get, P. And that's the probability of detecting the species, given we know that the species is present at a site. So each sampling occasion is treated as a temporal repeat of the survey. Um, and we had to make sure that our naive occupancy, which is basically um, the presence of a species uh, divided by the number of camera traps. So how, how frequently the species is being captured on a camera um, divided by our overall number of cameras um, in the survey system had to be over 0 0.2 to meet the assumptions that we had a large enough sample size. Um, and then we used uh, AIC model, um, selection criteria um, and all models um, less than Delta AIC2 were considered um, to have equivalent explanatory power. Um, we were looking at patch occupancy for spotted ground thrush. Um, so actual occupancy um, pooled across each individual forest patch. Whereas for Lemondorf, we were looking at the site occupancy um, at each camera trap site um, itself rather than at the patch level. So, um, sorry, I have a, I'll keep, excuse me a moment. So, 
So um, we got beautiful images, like you can see here, our spotted ground thrush at the top here, um, and our lemon dove at the bottom here. You can see how well they kind of blend into this um, into this leaf litter and, and vegetation. Um, so this is kind of obviously supporting the idea that they're quite cryptic and they're very, very good at sort of skulking around the forest and, and remaining undetected. Um, for the brown thrush, we had um, 42 out of 275 camera traps um, to record them. Um, and this was within 23 out of 82 um, actual forest patches. And then for the lemon dove, um, we had 76 out of 250 camera sites um, recording them in the spring summer season and 70 out of 250 camera uh, trap sites in the autumn winter season. So, you know, quite, quite a similar number of cameras capturing these, uh, these birds between autumn, winter and spring summer, suggesting that they are indeed um, resident in sedentary. Sorry, my slides seem to have frozen here. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, right. So uh, for the results of the spotted ground thrush, um, our top model um, indicated that patch size um, had a positive influence um, on occupancy. So the greater the size of the patch, the more likely um, and the higher the occupancy um, of the spotted ground thrush. Um, and bare ground, the percentage of bare ground um, also positively influenced um, occupancy. So the more bare ground, the more likely the site to be occupied. Um, and then the actual urban forest mosaic, um, as opposed to in the nature reserves um, or any other habitat type, positively influenced the occupancy as well, which is quite interesting. And then on the negative side, isolation distance um, had a negative influence on occupancy, spotted ground thrush. So as patches became more isolated, they were less likely to be um, occupied. Stem density of trees of six to 10 meters had a negative, um, negative influence, which was also quite interesting. And I think this sort of uh, suggests that they don't like so much these regenerating patches. They like the older patches with larger trees, more mature. Um, the Shannon Wiener Diversity Index um, also had a negative impact, um, which again is quite interesting. And I think that speaks to they like these patches that are more open with taller trees and a lot of uh, bare ground rather than many different um, heterogeneous structures um, that obviously make up a higher Shannon Wiener Diversity Index score. And then coastal dense bush uh, also had a negative um, influence, again, supporting the idea that these sort of regenerating patches with their more um, disturbed and more uh, heterogeneous structures um, aren't such a good influence on the species. And for lemon dove, um, we had a positive influence of herbaceous cover um, and stem density of six to 10 trees and percentage of woody cover in the autumn winter. Um, suggesting that during this time they like a lot more sort of dense habitats, um, perhaps being more cryptic, uh, staying away from predators. And then during the spring summer, they have a positive influence of bare ground, uh, which perhaps speaks to more foraging opportunities, particularly um, for provisioning of nestlings, which require um, you know constant sort of invertebrates, um, worms, that sort of thing. Uh, percentage of grass cover as well had a positive influence too. And stem density of 16 to 20, tree, 20 meter trees, which perhaps speaks to their uh, breeding requirements of um, robust platform nests in taller trees. Um, and percentage of leaf litter as well, perhaps speech, speaking to more, um, more foraging opportunities underneath the um, leaf litter. Um, and ESR, which has escaped me from uh, plant species richness. Um, so again, more. Um, diverse forests themselves in terms of the number of um, actual uh, tree species being recorded. So to sort of put this into context, um, both species seem to have a preference for tall trees with open understory. Um, so implying both are dependent on indigenous forests as opposed to sort of small uh, regenerating forest structure. 
Um, preference for complex habitat structures and high plant diversity and leaf litter um, and bare ground in breeding season for lemon dove, I think probably speaks to their uh, breeding biology. Um, and avoidance of small isolated patches in proximity to agriculture implies negative, uh, the negative effects of fragmentation for this um, for the ground crush. So I think we can sort of see the benefits um, of this bycatch data from a mammalian um, camera trap survey where we actually wound up getting very robust and replicable results for two um, reclusive species. Um, so this does support the use of camera traps for surveying reclusive terrestrial forest birds. Um, and the robust conclusions highlight uh, the application and importance of bycatch data for conservation and ecology. So bycatch data may provide critical insights into the behavior and response of biodiversity to ecological conditions or anthropogenic pressure. By examining the context of bycatch data, camera trap surveys offer a potential cornucopia of opportunities. So something to think about with your um, camera trap survey designs. If you are having um, other species that weren't target popping up all the time, you can think about the application of, uh, of these types of studies. But if it's not uh, representing your research interest, or if you don't have the time or budget to analyze these things, there's always uh, a bunch of students who are looking for projects, so we'll always be open to collaborate. Um, yeah, I think that pretty much wraps that up briefly. Um, it's just some acknowledgements and thanks very much for your time and attention. Uh, thanks so much. That was, yeah, that was incredibly interesting and I think it's, um, yeah, it's particularly relevant to us. Um, I know we, we often rely on presence of, of spotted ground thrush, particularly on our coastal forest systems to um, yeah, in support of our kind of conservation objectives. So um, yeah, it was, it was yeah, really, really useful. Um, quite interesting how you know, how many actual records you were able to achieve. And yeah, that's that's great because, you know, like you said, they're a very cryptic species. So um, yeah, quite encouraging. I mean, we were just, you know, kind of talking offline now and just, you know, our records of spotted ground there are, are largely restricted to our um, kind of smaller little reserves along the coastlines so things like um, Pigeon Valley and Lemon Bush and things like that. But um, yeah, we need to start start potentially putting traps in some of our um, you know, forest patches along along the coast and see if we can't up those up those numbers and yeah and get them and get kind of greater motivation for, for longer term protection. So yeah, so thanks for stimulating that. Line. Um guys, I don't know if there's um, any questions um, for for Dad um, from anyone else on the floor? And then I might just actually open it up. Generally, we um, yeah, it's been quite a long quite a long session, and thank you everyone for for participating in it. Um, but yeah, I might just open it up more generally. Um, if there are any any specific questions that, that anyone would like to look at, um, yeah, I'll ask any of the presenters. Now's your opportunity. I see if I may just jump in. Um, sure. Let's had a question for Yvette. Um, is a linear regression model appropriate for describing habitat preferences in a case where naive occupancy um, does not allow for analysis using present software? Um, Claudette, what presence basically does is run a bunch of um, linear models um, with your, um, your camera trap records um, being the um dependent variable and your um your habitat covariance being your independent variables anyway so it is sort of running linear regressions in the background so if the naive occupancy um is too low for present software um, you have the same um sample size issue um for running a regression um, independent of presence so um, obviously with a with a regression analysis, the more um, dots on the on the regression line, basically uh, the greater the sample size allows you to infer the prediction that is required for um, for a linear regression. So I think you may still come up with a very low explanatory explanatory or predictive power of a um, linear regression that doesn't have enough um, sort of dot sample sizes on that regression line. If that's um, if that's helpful.
Thanks, David. Um, yeah, sorry, I was just battling with the mouse there. Um, is there anyone else that would like to kind of ask any any questions? I, I know it's been quite a long session, so I'm not, um, yeah, I'm not expecting to kind of drag it at all. But um, yeah, if there are any questions now, I think the opportunity to to ask them. But if not, um, yeah, guys, I'd just like to thank all the presenters. Um, yeah, I'm Bali in the absence, Jared, Devet, David, I think you yeah, guys have done a fantastic job and thank you very much for introducing um, this incredible, yeah, this topic to us. And I think there's a lot of um, value that, that people have gained out of it. And I certainly I have, and um, yeah, I'll be, I'll probably be bugging you guys in the, in the not too distant future. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'd just like to say thank you very much. And, and in particular, I'd like to thank Preshni because she's been the driving force behind um, getting the momentum going on this. Um, so yeah, David, um, see your hands up. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we have a full list of um, attendees here, but um, if we can put together um, everybody's email address, if people are interested um, and they don't have it already, we can share with and the um the pdf the slides here in case it's useful and also the um Brett and i and a couple of um, other authors from esmville all put together a uh, best practice guide um for camera trapping so again if, if um colleagues don't have that we can make that available as well if we have a um a mailing list uh, to send out to everybody thanks Thanks. So that's going to be useful. And yeah, we can definitely share that. And I think that would be would be useful. I think the um, yeah, I think I think the people would, would appreciate that. So they can just work through uh, through me. I think um, yeah, I'll I'll reach out to to each of you and get that that information, and I'll I'll distribute it. So yeah, thank you. All right, um, guys. I think yeah, I think that's I think we've kind of exhausted this session. Um, yeah, once again, thank you as all the presenters. Thank you to Prashni, and yeah, thanks to everyone for your for your time. I appreciate it. Have a good Friday, and yeah, enjoy the weekend. Cheers. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, all. Bye.